Every law allows citizens to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit portions of copyright motion pictures, videotapes, or video discs under certain circumstances without authorization of the copyright holder for the purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which does not infringe on copyright under 17 U.S.C. 107. The climate crisis is about human security, economic security, environmental security, national security, and the very life of the planet. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. This last November 2022, global leaders from all corners of the world, as well as religious leaders from the three major Abrahamic religions and others, met, of all places, in Sinai, the location for this year's annual COP27 meeting. This, of course, was a historic place where God himself gave us his Ten Commandments handed to Moses for the children of Israel and by extension to the rest of humanity. Such a religious location, of course, was not by mere coincidence, but was purposefully chosen to hallmark what they intend to set forth here on in, the drawing up of a new global covenant and set of commandments for mankind, ten universal climate commandments that all faiths all nations and all peoples and creeds can and must embrace. That is, if we hope to ward off the so-called climate change extinction event that awaits us all if we don't get on board. Sinai, as their chosen location, wasn't merely symbolic, but is also extremely blasphemous as they seek to replace God's eternal commandments with their own. Only, it seems, they've taken themselves to the wrong Sinai as all biblical references, as well as strong archaeological evidence, point not to Egypt, but to Arabia. Yet, as is often the case, tradition proves more precious than truth to those who seek their own will. By the, quote, seeking a new vision for humanity, they suggest that the original Ten Commandments given by God on Mount Sinai is somehow no longer relevant or is outdated and obsolete and a new covenant is to be written up. Thus, they turn up at Sinai not to seek God for instruction, as they already arrived armed with their intentions, purposes and mock green commandment tablets beforehand. But, although making a show of fake godliness, they in reality seek to force their own will. And it isn't only the multi-faith religious leaders who are spouting such spiritual rhetoric at this COP27 event, as globalist political leaders likewise seem equally happy to turn their climate agenda into a new religious moral crusade. Listen to the language used here by Al Gore. I learned a teaching that is common to all three of the Abrahamic religions, that God has set before humanity a choice between blessings and curses between life and death. We face that choice today. The curses that we are continuing to choose are ever more apparent. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu said climate change is the apartheid of our times. We don't have to choose curses. We can choose blessings. The blessings of renewable energy. Mr. Secretary General, you said we are on a highway to climate hell. We need to take our foot off the gas. This is a moment for a global epiphany. It is not time for moral cowardice and reckless indifference to the future of humanity. As human beings, we also have the God-given ability to rise above those limitations. That is the way we can save our world. But we have to choose blessings instead of curses. We have to choose life over death. There is a path that we can make from here to a future with hope. But why are these world politicians and businessmen suddenly using a language of faith and religious conscience to address the nations on this subject? We are on a highway to climate hell. Let us not take the highway to hell. Let us earn the clean ticket to heaven. That is our responsibility. Well, the persuasion to do so is not an idea of their own, 
but comes from within the emerging multi-faith collective or the multi-faith movement we see increasingly involved. It being a faith umbrella term that the Bible calls a bed of spiritual harlots made up from all the world's works-based pagan and humanistic religions, unified together under the same great pretense of an impending climate catastrophe. Why? Because they too desire a bite out of this great apple of a global takeover and great reset. The multi faith movement too have found the cause under which they also can unify all faiths by which to bring to bear their false peace. Many apostate Protestant denominations also being on board, who have long since gone back home to Rome, and so have become the daughters of that great Roman mother harlot church, who has always spearheaded this multi-faith agenda and movement from the start. It is she, the Jesuit Catholic Church, with her daughters, who are poised to sit astride this resurrected iron beast of old that once was called Rome and is rising again. And it is she and her daughter harlots who have successfully convinced this resurrected beast that this time, in this age, he will not find success by trampling, crushing and breaking the nations in pieces as he once did. No, he, the beast, and the leaders of this emerging New World Order must first allow them, the religious leaders, with their adulterous Judas spirit, to seduce and guilt trip the masses into ethical submission over climate change and its impending catastrophe by worthlessly shepherding them away, not into global peace as promised, which only Jesus Christ can bring, but instead shepherds them into the arms of the beast, causing them to worship him, working and deceiving together under the guise of climate change. This surely is what iron mixed with clay well, looks like. Mixed with miry clay. Now, clay finally, we begin to see how that Babylonian harlot woman unites with the beast and rides astride it. As religion gets in bed with this new global empire, using their guise of peace and safety to ensnare every living soul on earth with its satanic agenda. This isn't the first time we've heard or seen such a push for a new binding covenant, apart from God's covenant at Sinai or through his son, Jesus Christ. Pope Francis and the Vatican have pushed for a long time for a new global set of rules or guidelines. And also, we have Judaism's and Chabad's major push for a universal set of laws called the Noahide laws, again, not at all based on the Ten Commandments, but on seven so-called universal laws given to Noah after the Flood and meant for all the nations. And don't make the mistake of thinking that this is some nondescript powerless movement, as this covenant, which again carries similar sentiment and sits in neatly with COP27, has been accepted, agreed upon and signed by most of the major nations including the US, who have signed it in every year ever since President Reagan until now. Then we've also had the Georgia Guidestones, which were recently, and we think symbolically and ritualistically, blown up and then destroyed. They too share more than similar sentiments, calling for a new Mother Earth-based humanistic covenant for mankind, complete with mass depopulation for her protection, of course. So, what do you think? Was their destruction a ritualistic symbolic expression of their true intention to destroy God's rule and hold over them and replace both Moses and Christ's covenants with their own, thus stealing God's world from him and robbing his own son's inheritance in the process? Incidentally, Psalm 2 both prophesies this and exposes it perfectly. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Could this be any more clear or accurate? These covenants which God gave mankind through Moses and his own son. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased.
Of the very cords and bonds they now plot to be unfettered from and seek to replace them with their own ungodly, unrighteous covenant and rule. And there's something else too. If all this is true, then just maybe our past understanding of Daniel 9, 27, where Antichrist confirms a covenant with the many, is just too small an understanding. Most of us have been taught that this refers to a peace deal or treaty that will finally end the fighting between Israel and her neighbors that we've seen for so long, but that the treaty will be broken halfway through. All this was a reasonable assumption without the gift of hindsight. But yet, in light of all we've just seen, Maybe we were short-sighted to reduce the phrase covenant down to merely a peace deal and with the many reduced to meaning simply Israel's neighbors. Maybe what we read in Daniel is exactly what it says it is, a new covenant, a new and blasphemous covenant designed for all humanity with the purpose and intention of replacing God's previous covenants, such as these original 10 commandments, but ultimately and especially the covenants of grace through Jesus Christ, whom they hate. No, this emerging covenant suggests something vastly more blasphemous and terrifying, where these global, political and religious wolves in sheep's clothing intend to bring on us all a new binding covenant and set of laws that all nations on earth will be required to adhere to. And when rolled out as if ethical, and for the survival of the planet, who is able to resist, cloaked in the language of peace, protection and safety for our world, the nations are stepping nicely into line, as they believe the lie. Far from being for our good, peace or safety, this covenant of deceit is actually designed to disinherit us from all we have, for the purpose of ultimate gain for the few. To do this, they must do away with Christ and his covenant of peace by robbing him of his eternal inheritance so that instead they attempt to become the kings and lords of God's earth. It really would be quite laughable. <laughs> you serious? If this attempted coup on Christ's inheritance wasn't destined to first bring so much death and destruction on our world before Christ return and utterly destroys them with the very brightness of his coming. All of this is why we see an ever-increasing war on Christianity, biblical ethics and on Christ himself. Before they can pull this off, however, he, Jesus Christ, must be removed. And so, by extension, all true believers in Christ, in the name of unity, will be required to compromise and apostatize their faith or face global exclusion or removal too. Is this to be the event which triggers that which the Apostle Paul warned about, that great apostasy to come, which sees so many believers walk away from our Lord? We believe so. John's revelation regarding this says, here is the patience of the saints that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those not faithful, however, will instead accept these new blasphemous commands and covenant, whose end will sadly be destruction, for which we should all be praying that the Lord might keep us from temptation and deliver us from evil. Where Christ's covenant brings true freedom and peace with God, this emerging covenant of man brings only the loss of all things for the majority of folks on earth, ultimately including the loss of their very eternal souls when its final expression, along with its damning mark that surely must come, is revealed. For this is Satan's Antichrist covenant, that a blinded world, and even the church, like Eve in the garden, is being seduced and suckered into by the lies, trickery and flattering words of these false prophets today. Yet, although they have been so very busy these many years, plotting and scheming how they might murder, rob, and disinherit both the Lord and the people of the world to take the booty of the earth for themselves, they do so in vain. Not just because God has already declared Christ Jesus his Son as Lord and King forever, but also because that which they work so diabolically hard to illegally obtain for themselves is doomed to pass away. And so, even if, apart from their lying agenda, Trying to walk you guys with so many
our climate might actually be failing to varying degrees. This in no way should come as a surprise for the true believer in God's word and in Christ, and in fact should refocus our goals and attention not on our earthly possessions, but instead on our heavenly inheritance. For the Lord has declared, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke, and the earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. The Lord Jesus repeats this truth when he declares, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In short, this brood of vipers, who are bent on global control and theft under the guise of saving the planet, but who in reality merely want all the Earth's resources for themselves, are actually inheriting nothing more than a planet surviving on life support, destined one day to pass away, which we believe ties in with a somewhat obscure statement from our Lord Jesus, just towards the end of Matthew 24, that reads, For wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered together. These vultures, bent on procuring the physical earth for themselves, ultimately are picking at the bones of a dying earth, who, being devoid of God's spirit, have no comprehension of a heavenly inheritance. For the Lord has made it abundantly clear that he will soon roll up this current worn-out reality, just like a scroll, and create a new heavens and earth where only the redeemed will enjoy eternity with him. But man is going to be wise enough to subject himself to this kind of control. And in case any are tempted to believe that, maybe all we've reported on is nothing more than the fanciful imaginings of a group of conspiracy nuts. To counter this, let's take just one example, for which there are many, and go back to 1990, where we meet the now late Morris F. Strong. Originally a Canadian oil tycoon turned entrepreneur, Strong finds himself quickly elevated up the ranks by the globalist elites. The world's number one environmental leader, presented by Lawrence Rockefeller. To the position of UN diplomat, where he ultimately becomes the author and founder of the UN Environment Programme, as well as the brains and will behind the Earth Charter itself. Along with other diplomats, world leaders and global businessmen, Strong attends the 1990 World Economic Forum being held in Davos, Switzerland. It is here, during an interview with an official reporter from inside the forum, Strong reveals to him that The real goal of the Earth Charter is that it will in fact become like the Ten Commandments. It will become a symbol of the aspirations and commitments of people everywhere. Advancing the synopsis further, he adds What if a small group of these world leaders meaning the like of such as were gathered there at Davos. Would it include that the principal risk of the earth comes from the actions of the rich nations? Sounds familiar? He continues. Isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring this about? Can you believe what you just heard? What? That guy. I don't have my hearing aid on. What the hell do you want? It's okay. Never mind. So what was proposed as concept some 30 plus years previous by Morris Strong and the UN has now miraculously become our modern reality and today's current affair. For not only do we now see the proposal for a new Earth Covenant as well as a call for a blasphemous replacement of the original Ten Commandments being pushed during COP27 and by the Vatican last year being supported not only by false religions but also, more shockingly, by what were historically considered to be bedrock evangelical and protestant denominations. But now, on top of this, we also witness the passing and signing of the new Loss and Damage Bill that requires all of the wealthier industrialized nations to compensate or give back billions of dollars each year to the underdeveloped nations. A move that will bring about the very collapse Morris Strong and the globalist elites require showing clearly how all of this is being played out 
to the letter just how it was proposed back in 1990. For this loss and damage bill, which we witnessed being agreed upon and signed in at COP27, is by no means some new concept, but was first proposed as becoming a bill back in 1991, just one year after Maurice Strong's alleged brainstorming statement to that reporter during the 1990 World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, showing us clearly again how this bill of climate justice concerning loss and damage against wealthier countries for the sake of poorer nations is in reality nothing more than a wicked agenda and is about as sincere as Judas was when he complained to Jesus about Mary after she'd poured out the costly oil over Jesus' feet to anoint them. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Funny, isn't it? How again today, it is the blessings of oil they are taking from us all, under the guise of giving back to the poor out of the loss and damage fund. And you can be certain of this, that in reality, they care nothing for the poor nations, but having their hands in the money box, they copy the works of their father, the devil, who is a liar and a thief. You're watching your country be dismantled right in front of you for what? The globalist system that was predicted in the Bible. And this is how they do it. Now here's the interesting thing. Daniel remarks that this thing, this, this beast system goes into a global government, but then is eventually ruled by 10 kings, 10 regional global governments under one king. The 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So out of the global government, 10 kings will arise controlling 10 parts of the world. Well, here's the funny thing. What is on the UN website? This has been on since 2009. Here are the regional groupings that the UN wants to do. You see North America Union, South American Union, the African, all that. Count how many the UN divided the nations in. 10. 10, was it an accident? Did they read the Bible? No, because the Bible predicts 10. This is what they predicted. It's like a Scooby-Doo show. They, the villain always tells you what they're going to do. But you know what I find? No one listens to them. Here's one of the villains, Dr. Otmar Edenhofer, explaining to you what this really is about. One has to free oneself from the illusion that the international climate policy is an environmental policy. What? Instead, the climate change policy is about how we redistribute de facto the world's wealth. What? He just said it. He's one of them. Time is running out to stop the climate disaster. The scientists are saying fish fires in Australia are a warning that the Biden administration around the world. A huge 7.5 earthquake causing a tsunami. We're now going to report several major cities being lit apart in an explosion. Reports are just coming in of an explosion on the Liverpool Street station. As said, this is a multi-pronged attack on the nations, an agenda bent on the collapse of the current world order so that their great reset might be fully unleashed upon all. The bringing in of their new world order or Novus Ordo Seclorum by way of unrighteous deception parading as righteous reparations. Nothing short of the burning down of what they call the old ways is their true agenda. To build a really better world sometimes means having to tear the old one down. Many who hear this message will cast it aside as disinformation. And we do not lose heart because of this, knowing that those who have ears to hear will hear. For the Lord was not merely being figurative in Revelation when he reveals his judgment over those who destroyed the earth. So make no mistake, there is coming a great collapse of the wealthy nations. We'll either subject ourselves to an internal or an external approximation of the apocalypse. And so we can either get our act together, which means to voluntarily subject ourselves to the flaming sword as an individual, or that will be impressed upon us as a necessity from without. And how intense that will get, we're, we're gonna find out because it's coming. Orchestrated purposefully by these lying devils to usher in Antichrist's kingdom on earth. 
But surely, some might say, something as benign and as wholesome as their care for the world cannot be what prophetic scripture warns about in the last days. You must be mistaken. You can't be serious. You cannot be serious. That, our dear brothers and sisters, is our very point. That's what I'm talking about. How seemingly benign, innocent and pure did, did Satan God make the forbidden fruit Satan. appear to Eve? Likewise to King Saul, when due to Samuel being late, Samuel, he should be here. Satan convinced Saul it would be far better if he sacrificed to the Lord himself. We must make a sacrifice before we attack. Rather than wait for Samuel and risk destruction, even though he was not ordained to do so. Which is not very much different at all than scaling the heights of Mount Sinai, albeit the wrong Sinai, <laughs> and writing your own Ten Commandments. And what of Aaron, who had been convinced that, due to Moses not returning from the mountain of God, that he should compromise truth for the sake of peace in the camp, and cast the idol, the golden calf. Is this why so many of God's shepherds today are apostatizing and buying into this golden calf of a climate covenant to save themselves, that replaces Christ? After all, they think, in the same way as Aaron thought, isn't he delayed in returning from heaven? And talking of false shepherds of the flock, why would it be that Pope Francis would appoint Hans Joachim Schoenhoover, the director of the Institute for Climate Impact in Potsdam, Germany, and climate advisor to the German government, to become a member of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy of Sciences, when Hans Schoenhoover is a self-confessed atheist? Aren't the scriptures clear enough on such issues, when they instruct the church not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yet, once again, the Vatican, and in particular Pope Francis, shows blatant disregard for the authority of God's word, just as they have always done throughout the ages. On top of this, Shane Hoover is a staunch advocate for global population control and mass depopulation, which completely flies in the face of God's instruction to mankind to be fruitful and fill the earth. Just another mystery as to why a so-called church would appoint such a man, unless of course such a church system is actually married not to Christ in its heart, but to the world. It is in no way mankind's mandate to take it upon themselves to manage global population, and is in fact, by its very nature, antichrist in spirit. Such a luxury belongs only to the Lord God Almighty himself, who has made it clear in scripture that he alone has set the day when the harvest of the earth will be full and ripe, and on that day he will return and sort the chaff from the grain and the weeds from the wheat. Yet they, the globalists, elites, and religious harlots, have stolen God's vineyard, the earth, and now attempt to disinherit both the Lord and his people. In truth, they intend harm and not good, and hide their true intentions behind hypocritical and false good works. Great lying signs and wonders, deceptions, in the form of climate disasters, global warming, health emergencies, false flag wars and events, and many other such things they do and have done, for which most people have already swallowed the poison pill of their deadly lies, having been systematically spoon-fed on a diet of climate and global warming propaganda, bombarded with false doomsday and apocalyptic imagery, and a constant flow of news reports following in the same ilk. There's only one issue we all need to address. The climate emergency. Our world's in a mess. Which are likewise backed up by the priests of the world's new religion, science. Constantly instructing us how we should trust the science. All the while, the so-called faith leaders of the world look down from their self-righteous ivory towers Headed by the Pope in the Vatican, they assure us all that the answers lie in one world, one race, and one religion solutions. 
all working together to brain soak us all, that the world might be renewed in its thinking, fit for Antichrist and his counterfeit kingdom. The sound of his wicked gospel has gone out to the whole world, concealed within all forms of media, popular culture and modern philosophy. Have you heard its broadcast lately? Come, all you wealthy and poor, good and evil alike, all you male and you female, or indeed otherwise, tangled orientations or warped appetites, or mere welcome fruits of a different kind. We have beliefs, we have ethics, hell we even have sin. Our doors of destruction do beckon all in. No change is required, no repentance of heart. But to blindside the truth, now that's how to start. Our Saviour is He who says lying's all right, and that suits you fine, since you rejected the light. So, why sink with that ship that is falling away, with Christ's promised return being so yesterday? Our son of perdition has made lying an art, with do what thou wilt, being his kingdom law. So roll up, step inside, there's but one tiny fee, to sell your inheritance on bended knee. Now, we've not been so open. We've cloaked this, of course, using lying agendas, coercion, and worse. But hook, line, and sinker, you swallowed the bait. By rejecting God's love, you've sealed your own fate. Yes, that son of perdition is likely right at the door. And just as Judas waited for the opportune time to betray the Lord and his brethren, so too Antichrist awaits his planned appointment to deceive and betray. When the illusion of global destruction and societal loss reaches its prescribed fullness, it is then he is likely to take his place on the world stage. Armed with this timely solution to the pressing need, many will be deceived into giving up what is sacred and eternal, purely at the expense of the moment. Not dissimilar to Esau, who, being hungry and in need of food, agreed to sell his birthright to his brother Jacob, simply to satisfy the need of the moment. And like their father Isaac, who being at his end of days, had grown quite blind, so to be completely taken in by Jacob, who had disguised himself as the true heir. Many of we too have grown quite blind in these end days, and are equally at risk of being deceived and succumbing to that fatal deceiver and doppelganger of Christ, who will attempt to rob Jesus of his inheritance. For we are Christ's inheritance if we hold fast to him. Would we trade our liberty, freedoms, bodily autonomy and eternal inheritance just to avoid suffering now? Like Lot's wife, deep down, are we still in love with the things of this life? Or can we walk away? choosing rather to suffer now than to sell out our Lord just for temporary relief. For the days are soon coming, and in some ways are already with us, when to continue to be part of this world system, you'll be required to accept that abominable covenant which we have spoken of. Maybe this covenant with death will be ratified in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem by Antichrist at another blasphemous UN COP meeting in the near future. We just don't know yet for sure. But there are a few things we do know for certain. For the Apostle Paul tells us plainly, before the Lord returns to gather us together to him, we are not to be deceived by any means. For that day will not come until the great temptation, rebellion and apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed. So. Let's arm ourselves with the preparation of the scriptures and our love for the Lord and one another. Fill up on the oil of God's love and promises and let go of the things of this world that we should have already have died to. Hold fast to the rock of your salvation and keep your eyes on Jesus during this storm of all storms. For he will come, so do not feel hopeless to part the waters of that storm and we will immediately be at our destination where we will forever be with the Lord. And on one last final note, understanding that without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sins. Remember how Abel, being a keeper of sheep, 
offered up the required first form of his flock and of their fat. But Cain, in disobedience, being a tiller of the earth, offered up the fruit of the ground and of his labour. The Lord God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice, but rejected Cain's, causing Cain to grow jealous and to hate Abel his brother, until finally he slew him. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. We tell you with a certainty now that those blasphemous things which happened at Sinai and the things which are about to happen regarding the climate and Mother Earth is the fulfilling of the Cain spirit, the worship, offering and saving of so-called Mother Earth and the development of Ten Climate Commandments is the epitome of the rebellion of Cain. But just as Cain, who'd made a show of religious self-righteousness through his wicked offering, yet, in reality, had murder in his heart, so too these false prophets of climate and nature worship who govern our world today. Not dissimilar to Judas, who, for a time, made a convincing show of being religious and self-righteous, yet who also had the spirit of Antichrist, murder and betrayal in his heart against the Lord. These wolves in sheep's clothing today are making a show of righteousness, but who, like Judas and Cain, have a heart set against Christ's body on earth, the bride. So be as wise as serpents, but harmless as doves, until the Lord returns from heaven. And one final question. Are we awake, listening and being directed by God's Spirit during these last deceptive days? Or are we taking our cues and our directive from the spirit of the age and its agents? How do we discern between the two voices? My shoulder, Angel. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. Well, John 3.31 tells us, He who is of the earth is from the earth and so speaks of the earth. He who is from heaven is above all. And again in 1 John 4 verses 5 through 6, They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. These false prophets of the end of days cannot speak of eternity or heaven, for they know nothing of it. Instead, their conversation is always rooted in the earth and of the things of this world and this life, saving the planet, the environment, the ozone, and this here and now short life, makes a hypocritical false show of caring for the poor, as Judas did, but all the while their real intention is to steal for themselves out of the coffers of this creation and this generation, while he who comes down from heaven comes only to save your soul and to give you eternal security and peace with God. It is him we should be listening to, and not the spirit of the age, which is the spirit of Antichrist. There is so much more to show and reveal on this subject matter, and we can't possibly reveal it all in one video, so we will be returning to this topic soon. But for now, thank you for watching, and may God bless you all. And to emphasize just one last time, we leave you with this clip. I don't expect that we're going to avoid collapse. Uh, I'm not sure what it, what it will look like. I mean, and uh, I mean, uh, some huge volcano could blow up tomorrow in Indonesia, or. Or, or epidemics. I mean, I don't know what it, what it will be, but uh, but in one way or another, we are so far globally. We are so far above the population and the consumption levels which can be supported by this planet that I know, in one way or another, it's going to come back down. The planet can support something like a billion people, maybe two billion. If you want more liberty and more consumption. You have to have fewer people, and conversely, you can have more people. I mean, we could even have eight or nine billion, probably, if we have a very strong dictatorship and a low standard of living. You can have it, but it, 
but we want to have freedom and we want to have a high sentence, so we're going to have a billion people. So we're going to have a billion people. And we're now at seven, so we have to get back down. So we have to get back down. What? He just said it! He's one of them! The fourth industrial revolution offers us risks such as COVID, a high inflation, climate change, exploitation of nature, global warming, and deep nuclear extinction.